Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking time out and uh, coming here for the talk. We will start in a couple of minutes. Okay, Piyush is here. We'll start right away. Uh, for all the people in the back, we are also streaming live at the cafeteria. So if it's getting too crowded back there, some of you could uh, go to the cafeteria. It's streaming live there too. And we are streaming live to VS and uh, Mantri, EA, Salarpuriya, and JB. So big hi to all the folks there. And uh, without further ado, ado, I call upon Piyush to introduce our esteemed guest today. Thank you, Rajesh. Um, I don't know how I can introduce uh, Sebastian. I'm sure all of you already <laughs> know him. Uh, but just in case you don't uh, know the details, let me uh, tell you, you know Google's self-driving car. He was the person behind that. He was the person behind Google Glass, Google X. Before that, uh, uh, faculty at Carnegie Mellon and Stanford, 380 papers and member of the National Academy of Science, and, and uh, so on and so forth. So before much ado, let me just uh, pass it on to him. Yeah. All right, I think I have a microphone. Thank you. Um, so I, I was told that I come here to Flipkart, and there's going to be a few people I have a little conversation with. I didn't understand. My god, you guys are amazing. Um, also, I realize I'm speaking to some of the smartest engineers on this planet right now, which intimidates me. Um, but it's great to be here. Um, it's great to see so many of you. Um, what I have here is a presentation that I gave yesterday at the Google Developer Day. Uh, but most of it, I'm just really open to Q&A and questions you might have, because it's much more fun to have a dialogue than just a monologue. Um, let me skip this first. And, um, one of the, the probably best known things I've done was um, building cars that drive themselves and making humans obsolete. Um, to um, make cars safer and um, uh, make driving more fun. Yeah? Yeah? Good. Thank you. All right. Um, the project started um, pretty much exactly 10 years ago, actually on October 8th, uh, 2005. We had a, a big competition organized by the U.S. government um, called DARPA Grand Challenge. And the content of the competition was to build a car that could drive itself through the desert. And we built a car called Stanley um, that drove through Mojave Desert 130 miles. Um, and about 196 other teams built competing cars. And at the end of a competition, we were able to finish first uh, and build the very first desert driving car that could finish what's called Double Grand Challenge. We won two million bucks. That's all at Stanford. And then we realized um, that we could actually make cars drive themselves, period. We haven't succeeded in Bangalore yet. And <laughs> seeing the, <laughs> the being stuck in traffic for more hours than I, I, I could wish, um, I know that you guys actually need flying cars. You don't need self-driving cars. <laughs> um, but this project led to a serious evolution. And there's some interesting insights in here. Um, first of all, why on earth did Google do this? Like, why on earth uh, would a company like Google, who specializes in monetizing search, building self-driving cars? There was a lot of speculations. Um, one was, oh, while you're in a self-driving car, you can browse the web and make Google more money. <laughs> but that wasn't the rationale. Um, the rationale really was that the Google founders, Larry and Sergey, who are both good friends of mine, um, really care about relentless innovation. Right? So we live in an age where innovation moves faster and faster and faster. And most companies, while they're enjoying their own innovation, are already being disrupted by somebody else. It takes on average five years to be disrupted. You guys are eight years old, so you're probably going to be disrupted very time soon. We probably don't know yet, yet who's disrupting you, because you're still disrupting Amazon and others. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the speed of disruption has become really fast. And uh, Larry and Sergey believe um, that to escape this, you have to always go into uncharted territory. You can't stay where you are. You can't be a Yahoo who does the same thing for a long time. You have to flip over and do the next thing. Um, so they were willing to say, now that we have a, a certain amount of cash in the bank, as in $50 billion, um, US dollars, let's go and, and, and relentlessly innovate. Um, so they recruited me, a uh, big mistake on the end, to, um, to run innovation. Uh, I, I, at the time, was a Stanford professor, so I was really good in words, but not good in deeds. 
Um, and I built this team, a self-driving car team, of which I unfortunately don't have a video because we, we had a memory stick to transfer this. But I'm sure some of you have seen the, the work. Um, we started out um, in a really interesting model. We started out saying, OK, we're going to set ourselves a milestone. And the milestone, um, she was not set by me, it was set by Larry and Sergey, um, was to drive 1,000 miles on California streets. But Larry and Sergey got to pick those miles. And I still vividly remember this session, hanging out with the founders. And they're trying to find the most evil roads in California you could possibly not drive. And mark those and say, Sebastian, if you can build a car that can drive those roads in traffic, at doing daylight hours or night hours, without killing a person, without actually a person taking over, you make the equivalent of like a million bucks. Um, and I, as the expert in the field, said it's completely impossible. I'm a professor at Stanford. This cannot be done. And then Larry said, but people can do it. And I said, well, yeah, people are special. And Larry said, how so? And I said, well, they can do it. And Larry said, well, but machines can do stuff that people can do. And I said, well, I don't really have an argument against it. So let's me try it. So we tried it out. And within about 18 months, we were able to drive these really complicated 1,000 miles. And then we moved on from there. The thing that keeps the project driving is, um, is there's a really interesting insight about artificial intelligence here that, that unfortunately puts people at a disadvantage. Um, when you drive a car, which I'm sure some of you do, and you make a mistake, which I've seen a few even in my two days here in Bangalore, <laughs> <laughs> then typically what happens is uh, the person making a mistake learns from it, and nobody else does. Right? When this car makes a mistake, and they made many mistakes, they made every single mistake in the books was made by the self-driving car, um, then the car learns from it, but all the other cars learn from the same mistake, including all the unborn cars. And that means the rate of learning in computer automated cars is faster than the rate of learning in people. So if you graph this and the people are here at any point in time, and your robot is down here in performance, it can drive maybe five miles without incidents, and the human can drive, I don't know, 500,000 miles. At some point, the learning curve of the robot is faster than the human. And what it means is there's going to be an infliction point when the robot drives better than the person. And that infliction point just happened this year. So we're now at the point where the robotic cars drive better than people can drive. So now it's irresponsible to drive a car. Um, <laughs> and we should really cede our control to the computer overlords. Um, really interesting story about AI. And I think as Flipkart dives more into machine learning, you find the same in machine learning. As you engage in machine learning, um, the the learning speed itself will make this stuff better and better and better at a faster pace than people can learn. And as a result, AI will basically take over most parts of what we do, um, including software engineering, in my opinion. It's a different story for Q&A. Um, I then got to work with um, something even crazier, trying to build the next generation computer platform. And that platform um, hasn't launched here as a product. It launched as an um, Explorer edition, where we gave to 10,000 people or sold 10,000 people versions of it. But we haven't, uh, it's still being improved and it's going to come out as a product sometime soon under Tony Fidel, um, who's the CEO of Nest. But the idea was to make a computer that sits in your face. Um, why would we have a computer in your face? Well, these are our current computers. You guys are 100% mobile or 99% mobile, so you know about this more than anybody else. Uh, and these are kind of cool. You can carry them with you. Right? So for dinosaurs like me, that's a big deal. Because when I started programming, I had punch cards. Uh, my very first job was a computer as big as half of this room, where um, called a mainframe, right? With lots of terminals. You have no clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and then we moved to PCs. I, I was able, when I became a grad student, to buy my first PC. It was really nice. It was like this size, really small. And then my first laptop was also this size, really heavy but you could carry it, which was really amazing. Uh, and then laptops shrunk to the stuff you guys have today. And then they moved into um, cell phones. And this cell phone, of course, is better than the mainframe I was able to do when I was a young person in terms of any, any compute power. Um, anyhow, so we, we, we asked the question, is this going to be the final version of computing? And the answer is, heck no. This is also a really bad thing. Like, you walk around like this, you're socially challenged. You bump into stuff along the way. Um, and it has many, many disadvantages. But it would be really cool to have a com computer camera not just in your pocket. So when you want to take a picture of a person, you do this and unlock it. And you'll finally, if you take a picture, you guys are amazing. 
Okay. Um, but um, instead, it would be really great to have a, a camera where your eye is, right? So for a while at Google X, we studied neurosurgery and see if you could like implant the camera into your physical eye to see if you can take pictures. <laughs> it's not a good idea. It's not a good product. Partially because it would occlude your real eye, so you couldn't see anything anymore. So it's not a good idea. Uh, so we came up with the second closest thing, Google Glass. This is Sergey um, Brin, Google co-founder, wearing it, who wore it every day for like four years or so. Uh, but it has a camera. It has a display that sits up here. It has two microphones. It has a dual core processor. It has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. has a head tracking unit, GPS, uh, IMU, uh, accelerometer or magnetometer. And it has a, um, a trackpad on the side has voice recognition, has a speaker. So it's basically a full-blown computer. It's all these things that your, your cell phone has. And it weighs about 41 grams. Um, so 41 grams is slightly heavier than normal glasses, about as heavy as like fashionable sunglasses. But we put the battery behind your ear. We had a battery supply for a day. It would count, it would count the lever, the weight behind your ear, so it would feel like uh, completely weightless. So we had a weightless computer that you carry on. Uh, we called it glass, unfortunately. We didn't realize how bad the name was. Um, because someone came with the word glass hole. And <laughs> once the word glass hole was up, we realized we made a mistake. So it's, it's going to have a different name in the future, that's for sure. Um, and then we started selling it and, uh, and exploring a different, different dimension of use. And it became a really great camera to people. It really became, um, I think the number one use of it became photography. Uh, being in the situation and being able, uh, with a wink of your eye, we had a little wink detector so you could wink your eye and take an image. Look a little bit dorky to this, but it's very fast, so you can take images really, really fast. Um, it also had a really great um, cell phone mode where you could have hands-free conversation. And uh, rather than having a speaker, it had what's called a, a bone transductor uh, transducer, which basically vibrates your skull and makes your skull into the speaker. And the nice thing, even though the speaker was on one side, you had the sensation of having a uh, voice on both sides, so you could have a hands-free conversation and talk to yourself. Um, um, and you used to be able to talk to yourself and you looked like an idiot. Now you could talk to yourself and don't look like an idiot with this device. Um, that actually we had in the market for quite a while, an Explorer version, and we learned from it. Uh, we're currently improving it. And it's going to come out as a product sometime very soon. Um, we, uh, we learned a lot about it. So we learned that strip club owners don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Got banned from many, many strip clubs, even though we never tried to use it there. Um, we learned that... Um, in one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's a bit too aggressive to have a device like this. But when you go out and about skiing, bicycling, it's a fantastic device to share experiences and do extreme sports and so on. And then we went crazier. Um, this is also a computer. Um, I don't know if you've seen this, Project Iris, which actually was very successful. We, we licensed it out to a major device manufacturer. Um, this computer doesn't have its own battery, and it sits on your eye. It's actually a contact lens. So you put it in your eye. And it has a little inductive loop. And when you bombard it with inductive energy from an outside source, the inductive loop captures some of the energy and powers the computer. And next to the computer is a little sensor. And the sensor measures glucose. Uh, so it measures your blood sugar, or you say your tear sugar, your sugar in your content in your eye, and becomes a very reliable measurement for your blood sugar. Why would you care about your blood sugar? Well, some 600 million or so people in the world have diabetic. Um, so you might care about your blood sugar values multiple times a day. The best previous system that most people use involves drawing blood from your finger. You're stabbing your finger. So this was the very first working, non-invasive blood sugar uh, measurement device. Again, it doesn't feel like Google business, but uh, we were able to, to build those and really accurately measure uh, for hundreds of millions of people, and hopefully soon, uh, blood sugar content. And then we did something even crazier. Um, this is one of my favorite projects. And the last one I'm going to cover here for Google X. Uh, these are balloons um, that go into the stratosphere. Um, so it turns out Google has a big interest in wiring up the world. So does Facebook. And there's a big competition going on right now between Google and Facebook. Who can reach everybody in the world and give them internet? Um, in India, there's lots of rural places that are currently not covered. And it's even worse in, in many other places in the world including the open oceans, which also have no good broadband because laying fiber in the ocean is very hard. Um, so these devices are, are kind of a competitor to satellites. So when you launch a satellite, you have to put a rocket up and put a lot of fuel in and launch it and hope it doesn't explode along the way, as they often do. And eventually it finds itself in orbit and orbits around 
the Earth and provides you communication. Uh, launching a balloon like this is really easy. You do that. <laughs> and there it goes. The idea was actually Larry's idea. It's really funny. Larry had this idea when he was a grad student at Stanford and he went to a professor and said, I have this crazy idea. I want to build balloons around the globe to make a new internet. And the professor said, it's complete bullshit. It doesn't work. <laughs> and I know the professor was my neighbor, so he told me about this. Uh, and we decided, okay, if the Stanford professor said it doesn't work, it's a really good thing to try. <laughs> so... So we tried it, we built these balloons. Now, um, balloons are being released every day by the tens of thousands, they're typically weather balloons. And the way they work is you fill them with helium usually, or with different gas of, uh, typically helium, maybe hydrogen. And um, as the balloon ascends, um, they get larger and larger because the atmosphere pressure is, 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 is weaker and weaker as you, as you go higher up. And eventually, it was, become so large that they, they um, explode and they come down. And, uh, but if you make them so they can't expand, then they find themselves at a specific height and they sit there and hover there. And um, we built these balloons very secretly in, in, in California and launched them like crazy. And they would sit there and so they wouldn't like go around the globe and be detected by, I don't know, China. Um, <laughs> we put a little mechanism, we could punch a hole in it. And one day I remember, uh, I opened my web browser and CNN has this front page head news that a UFO has been sighted over Kentucky. <laughs> and it showed, at the, at the time, these balloons looked like oversized condoms, like very long things. <laughs> and it showed this picture, and they had this video interview with this like, nutcrack kind of UFO guy, and he was like speculating whether he's extraterrestrial life or not. But they had seen it multiple times and taken photos of this shiny a condom in the air. <laughs> and I called up my team, and the team said, oh, yeah, we lost one of those, sorry. <laughs> They made it all the way to Newfoundland and finally <laughs> landed and we, we retrieved it. Um, but this has progressed to the point where these balloons are now up there for more than a year at a time, which is actually quite an engineering challenge. Um, the amount of solar radiation is enormous up there and the temperature variation between day and night are enormous. Day is extremely warm, days, nights are extremely cold, like minus 50 degrees or more. Um, and they float around the globe. In fact, we had one incident we got really good in talking to ambassadors. We had one incident um, in India, it turns out, <laughs> where we, we uh, flew over India and um, we got a very angry phone call uh, from the embassy uh, saying, you guys are doing spy equipment over our country, which is an, is an ill-defined uh, legal situation. If you're at 100,000 feet in the stratosphere, whether it's a territorial part of India or it's part of space. Like space is open, you don't have territorial claims on space. If you go to 50,000 feet, you're inside a country, but at 100,000 feet, the stratosphere is not quite known. So different countries make different claims. Some countries say it's not our territory. India happens to say it's our territory. <laughs> um, and then, then from that incident, we actually learned how to deal with the ambassador of India, specifically India. So next time we had an, a balloon lost over India, we'd call him up and say, hey, um, we have a little problem. We have lost a balloon. Can you guys shoot it down? <laughs> and then we never heard from them again. Um, because no one can shoot these things down. So it's very embarrassing for a country to admit that they can't shoot it down, so they don't call you back. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of stories. Anyhow, it's now at the point that we have, a, um, I mean, we, I'm not Google anymore, but the Google team now has um, done tremendous progress. Um, this will be launched first of the Southern Hemisphere, because there's fewer North Koreas in the Southern Hemisphere, fewer countries, turns out. There's only a quarter of many landmass in the southern hemisphere is the northern hemisphere. Um, and it's demonstrated uh, connectivity to very remote places. Um, there's actually should add to this, there's now a new version of this which is going on at, at um, Google and Facebook, which you can read in the news, of planes um, that do the same thing but are more geostationary. There's now technology that you can build planes that sit up in the air, solar powered. They charge batteries during the day and during the night they kind of slowly descend. And we are just at the brink, we can make these planes, they can stay up forever. Um, where they just have enough lift with big wings, enough solar power that they can harvest enough energy during the day that during the night they don't descend too much and accommodate the winds and so on. So um, both Facebook and Google are very actively working on planes that would stay over a territory for a long time. And again, they'll be much, much cheaper than satellites. Um, that's kind of... Um, a little bit to Google X, and I'm super happy to 
bring this into more of a Q&A forum. Um, I left Google X about uh, three years ago because I, um, I wanted to do something in education. I felt education is something to try. And the appetite inside Google for doing education was very low at the time. It's changed a lot since. Um, so I decided to spin out the company and become an entrepreneur. Um, so I said goodbye to Google and became my own little CEO uh, with his own challenges. Um, but um, we came to India uh, specifically to, to see you guys, but also to uh, uh, launch uh, Udacity India. Has anyone uh, heard of Udacity before? Okay, wow. Is anyone taking a class or sign up for a class? Okay. Is anyone taking AI class? Okay, cool. Anyone finished AI class? <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, do you realize that AI class was, was taped between 3 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> Those paying attention would probably know. Um, so about three years ago, or four years ago, I, um, I was teaching at Stanford. I was running my Google X job during the day and decided to... Um, to think like Stanford sucks because you're so like, locked up, you can't get in, you have to pay $50,000. So it was time to, um, to rethink moonshot thinking for education. Uh, so I sent an, one email that basically said, uh, my class, Artificial Intelligence, Introduction to Artificial Intelligence, is now available free of charge for anybody in the world to take. Um, sign up over here, and you get the same exams and homework assignments as Stanford students, so you can compare yourself. And I mean, at the time, AI was not as hot as it is today, so we expected maybe 500 students in the world might say that I care about this, which is a big number. But lo and behold, um, 160,000 students signed up. So I was teaching a class to 160,000 students, which is more than fit in the biggest stadium on the planet. Um, then um, the bizarre things happened. So, now I'm, I'm, I'm scrambling to put together a technology platform to teach 160,000 students and make 160,000 homeworks graded and so on. Um, and um, all of a sudden we get these emails from our students like telling us their stories why they're taking this class. Uh, we find like soldiers in Afghanistan who are under mortar attack, secretly on the side trying to pass my homework assignment. Or mothers that raise children taking this class. All of a sudden, the entire world takes. In fact, I got to this point, I could go to any city on the planet and would walk around for 20 minutes, and someone would say, Hi, professor, to me <laughs> for a short amount of time in my life. Um, from the 160,000 students, 23,000 finished. Uh, we scored all of them, and then we stacked ranked them to Stanford students, and it turned out the top 412 students were online students, and the best Stanford student was number 413. <laughs> so that kind of signaled to me that for every great Stanford student, which is like a, a great place with like great students, like the best Stanford student, there's probably 400 better people in the world than this one student. And I bet a good number of them sit in this room over here, to be honest. And why aren't they not at Stanford? Well, because they grew up at the wrong place, they have the wrong parents, they, they're too old, they're too young, they can't afford it. They didn't pass the SAT test because, you know, in their country there's no SAT, like Germany. Uh, almost no student from Germany ever makes it to Stanford because there's no SAT in Germany. Um, whatever the reason is. But it doesn't mean people in Germany are stupid. It just means they're not at Stanford. Um, so we decided to really rethink education. And in this rethinking process, which took several years, we really kind of arrived at a formula where we decided, let's just build the university from scratch and build everything new. So we have a formula now, which I kind of launched yesterday, at Google I.O. Uh, for India with Indian pricing, where we um, offer new degrees um, online entirely. Compared to college tuition costs in the United States, we are dirt cheap. I've been told compared to India income, we're still kind of expensive. Um, we made up our own degree, nano degree. There's no law against inventing new degrees. This degree has actually been uh, accepted now by lots of companies in America. This, this is actually going out like a wildfire. This thing is growing really fast. We're growing about 33% every month. Um, so it's, it's been a very successful venture. Um, we decided to position the company and the another degree as intermediate between students seeking jobs. You guys have all the best job in the world, so you don't pay attention to this, but maybe your future employees could be paying attention. And then, of course, employers like yourself seeking top talent, uh, which you do seek um, and, and try to find because you're growing really fast. You're growing 100% every year. Um, and instead of kind of waiting for universities to do the right job, 
just do it ourselves. And um, the, the, uh, let's see, we have seven of those underway now. Um, the most relevant to you guys is Android, probably. We, the, the Android network is actually built by Google directly, by the Google Android team. So they cut together and asked, like, what's a top-notch Android developer look like? What they, and they codify this into a new degree program. It's pretty tough. Um, I don't think anybody here finished one, to be honest. Um, iOS, then we have a front end, we have a full stack. Data analyst, actually we're gonna launch a machine learning one very soon, but data analyst is a kind of a mini version where you learn statistics and data wrangling and so on. It's a really good, I know that you guys are interested, but uh, probably have an opportunity to do even more in the space of, of big data, um, which is actually really important for, for companies like Amazon and Netflix and Google. We have an intro one, and the most recent one we launched last week was Tech Entrepreneur. So for anybody in India and beyond who wants to start their own business around an app, it's kind of the stuff that you need to know beyond building an app, like search and optimization and digital marketing and, 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 and social networks and so on. Um, the companies we're working with, unfortunately, yours isn't on there yet. We hope to change that. Am I making progress, Clarissa? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, but a whole bunch of the Silicon Valley companies, since we live in Silicon Valley, uh, we work with Silicon Valley, so these are some of the best brands in Silicon Valley, and they build education now. So we made companies becoming the universities of the future. So the companies go and they build education, and we are the platform in between, which means we're kind of cutting out the universities a little bit. Um, but um, so Google, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, and many others. Um, and then we, we place lots of students in jobs. These are some of the companies. Um, you might recognize some of them. They're kind of random. Google is among them, Nest. Um, and then we also... Um, I'm Kelly. I'm oh, originally from New Jersey, and I she moved found back the job. to San Francisco about a year and a half ago. She found a job at Google. Long video. Um, we have a lot of students in India. In fact, India is our second biggest uh, country in terms of engagement. In fact, there's been a whole bunch of people, in, like by the probably tens of thousands, that have been incredibly good, faithful customers of our free product. We have a free version and a for pay version. Uh, <laughs> The free version is particularly popular in India. <laughs> <laughs> I want to change that because I don't want to go bankrupt. Um, but but we, we had uh, yesterday there Vishnu, who is a, a guy from Bangalore, who is in our iOS and another degree, just finished it. Um, and is also a, a code reviewer. We also employ people from India. Um, we have a network of code reviewers. And then we have people from uh, Mumbai, I guess, um, another Bangalore person. And um, let's see, Arpana is uh, um, from Chennai, I believe. Um, did a lot of free courses with us. Uh, hasn't paid us money yet. But she's uh, also a code reviewer and a, a marathon runner. Anyway, lots of people in India. I won't give you all of them, just those four. Um, and then one of the things that we, we try to invent in education is how to make this really successful, how to make it really fun. So the ones of you who have taken our free classes or AI class probably realize they sucked. They're really poor in some sense because it's really hard to stay motivated and finish. It's really easy to start. Um, we really care about education success. So we ended up um, recruiting a, a huge number of people from around the world on a contract basis to become graders and give people personal feedback and mentors and lots of services that we do. Um, these graders come from around the world. Um, so we pay them money um, if you study with us, you have personalized assistance and so on. And they make a lot of money themselves, they get good ratings and so on. Anyhow, um, we have this entire ecosystem now of instructors around the world and students around the world that learn from each other. And we make a little bit of money, uh, most of the money from the students, we pass them to the graders and back and so on. We have a working university system. Student growth is fast, this is my 30%. The access are missing, that's really bad. Um, it could be very little, but it's actually a lot. You're growing about 30% every month. Um, and why, why would we love India? Um, I've actually, I love India for many reasons. I um, came to India first in 2008 as a Google employee, building up um, an outsourcing team in Hyderabad, an engineering team in, in Bangalore. And I spent a lot of time in India. I learned a lot about India. Um, a lot of respect for the general education level and for the enthusiasm and for the fact that most people take their fate in their own hands much more than in many other places. Um, but you're also the second largest country when it comes to software developers. And I think by 2018, you'll be the, the largest 
So you have more software developers in this country than any other country, including the United States. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, you also have a very rapidly fast-growing community on Udacity. In terms of free enrollment, uh, you're, you're growing just 100%, I know. <laughs> in terms of for pay, uh, none of enrollments, we have a 5x, so it's 500% growth in, in 11 months, about 600% a year. Um, so there's some opportunity here. But I also believe, I mean, looking at India from a 10,000 foot perspective, while you have a good, lot of good universities, there's this number that 75% of engineering graduates aren't ready for their jobs. And I think it's because there's a mismatch between the professors you guys are able to recruit and what your companies want to do. Your companies move so much faster than your universities. So I see a huge opportunity gap um, that we're trying to fill. So when you come to us, you can learn the most contemporary skills in iOS and Android and big data science and so on, stuff that your professors probably don't know yet. And when they finally know it, it's probably too late because the world has moved on. Um, so we are, we are trying to be really, really fast in building new university. Um, it costs some money. We give ha actually, we give half the tuition back when you finish, so it costs less money. Uh, this is a monthly fee. Um, and we have scholarships. You don't need this because you're already in jobs, um, but the rest of India might benefit from Tata Trusts and Google's great deeds of giving scholarships. Um, having said this, um, we love to have more of your questions, so I stop talking. Hmm? We have a question and answer thing. Oh, cool. Good. So, can someone project questions? Top question. Just curious, now that you've seen the traffic in Bangalore, do you think Stanley can successfully navigate your ride back to the airport? It depends on how much time you give it. <laughs> um, so, the type algorithms we use in the United States would get stuck here. So, I think the behavior would be. Um, that the car would wait until 2 in the morning, and then finally inch forward. <laughs> and since my flight tonight is at 4.30, it would be perfectly fine for me. <laughs> um, now having said this, so I, an interesting observation about traffic. First of all, I'm still trying to understand the Indian traffic rules. So I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I get the impression the right of way is related to the size of the vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> um, although I've, I mean, last time I came to India was 2008, and I saw a lot of camels back then, and those have disappeared. Uh, at least in Hyderabad, I saw them, not here in Bangalore. Um, but in principle, the nice thing about robotic cars, there's much more precision. Like, they understand up to the inch, centimeter, where exactly where you're going, what your speed is, and so on. Um, I mean, programming it to be effective in traffic is a different story but we could probably make it extremely safe here compared to today's traffic situation. So I take no claim. I mean, we've never tried to drive here, and it'll probably be a lot of work, but in principle, I see no reason why we couldn't be able to make it work within a year or two to work really effectively here. Um, what do you think about the way us humans are learning things today and what we'd like to change about it? So, I mean, humans, I like them, but they also suck. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if I, if I ask myself, like, what are the big things in the history of humanity um, and what is happening today? Um, going back to the 1300s, when Gutenberg in, in, invented print, that was the first digital revolution. We built digital books to be able to replicate uh, in a cost-effective way, in a nearly, nearly lossless way, which is exactly what digital is, right? Um, so digital is really old. And what the book did to us is it changed everything about society. All of a sudden, we could store information outside human brains. Human brains are really bad for information storage. It's very hard to get information in. It's very hard to get information out. And retaining information is even harder. Um, if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so we were able to take this information outside the human brain and put it somewhere else and, and replicate it. And as a result, we were able to, to really retain and build an information in a way that's completely impossible in the human brain alone. So we built this aid called book. And we just witnessed the most amazing revolution on top of it, which is the now digital revolution, the internet and so on. We're able to memorize videos and all kinds of stuff in a way, sounds, um, vast amounts of text, obviously, um, digital e-commerce transactions, what have you, uh, outside the human brain, stuff you could never ever memorize, right? So Google, 
you could never replicate in the human brain because the human brain just isn't good, isn't good enough. So we have far surpassed the human brain. Um, I think the next step is going to be we're going to outsource everything, all our personal experiences. Like we're going to have Google Glass on all the time, record everything we do, and then be able to learn from it, and then be able to replicate ourselves very quickly, in my opinion, because we're not that complex. Um, so that means we can build robots that couldn't do all our email, for example, or all our software on the right um, in the near future. Um, that sounds a bit crazy, but I actually I really believe it because um, if if he had a, a human observe you for a year or two, they could probably predict most of what you do, and if you can observe all the people for ten years, we can probably predict everything we do, um, or almost everything we do, um, and that would be completely revolutionary. So there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to make the human race a better race and use technology in ways you haven't anticipated. Um, in a country like India, with vast language diversity and many regions not having access to technology, how can MOOCs be designed differently to assure success? So first of all, I think we should just move to one language, uh, <laughs> rationally speaking. Um, actually, historically, what happened is, as, as um, travel and, and uh, intermarriage and intercommunication increases, the number of languages goes down. Um, that's happening worldwide today. Um, go to China, lots of people speak English. If you go to, to Germany, there used to be like two dozen different languages. Now there's just one language. Um, but yeah, it's a real issue. So we're currently doing English. Um, we know we're going to get a small sliver of people. Um, we might do Hindu, Hindi. Um, and we hope between English and Hindi, we might be able to get about 50% of the population. And then we'll see how much the demand is. Um, we have a lot of volunteer translators that have helped us in the past translate our materials. Um, I wish we could reach everybody. I think the bigger obstacle right now is actually cost of digital, like being able to have bandwidth um, and having access to that. And that's, that's certainly progressing in India right now, but it's a big open issue. Um, I would love to see a lot of traction here in India uh, now that we have an, a localized version. And um, somehow I have the impression we are going to get a lot of traction because there's an enormous number of, of aspiring people here who'd love to be productive in places like Android and iOS and so on. Do you feel virtual or immersive reality be a great lever to e-commerce? Google Cardboard, smartphone tech, that's a fantastic question. Uh, I talked to Zuck about this. Why, I asked him why did he buy um, uh, Oculus Rift. And he basically gave the same answer. He said, look, there got to be something after the phone. It might as well be a virtual reality device. And of course, there's the non-see-through, which kind of isolates you, like Oculus Rift. And then there's see-through devices. There's a company called Magic Leap, which has become very, very hot uh, in Florida that builds a see-through device, a set of glasses. Um, whether it be an e-commerce device, I don't know. It's a fantastic question. Um, you could speculate. Like, um, there's this beautiful application that Google has put on phones where you can take an image of objects, and if the phone recognizes the object, you can just order the same object. Right? So if you find a dress you like, you take a picture, and if the dress is known in the database, you might, on a button press, get the same dress sent to your home. Um, so the indexing of the world of stuff you care about uh, might change. They might move away from search or catalogs into physical world indexing. Uh, the problem with that is, so far, the recognition rates are very poor. Um, not very many things can be recognized by, by, by camera images. But it's a fantastic question. If I was um, Flipkart, I would probably get myself a device and just play with it and see what happens, if there's any kind of interesting modes. Maybe there's actually interesting visualization modes where you can look at objects differently from the way you look at a phone and get a much different experience before you make a purchasing decision. Um, how would you convince people that AI would only be a blessing rather than a threat to mankind? Um, the reason why people think it's a threat is because they watch too many science fiction movies. Um, <laughs> it's actually, in every, hist every phase of history when new technology was invented, there was a whole bunch of people who said it's a threat. It's bad, right? Lots of stuff invented were bad. Um, and would have negative consequences. And in reality, the consequences tend to be positive. I mean, if you look at the way we live today versus 150 years ago, you're so much better off. Um, I, I don't subscribe to the version that AI just takes over the world, like Elon Musk does. I think we're going to use AI to make ourselves smarter and more powerful, as we always have done with technology. Like, um, planes make us faster. They don't work for themselves. They work for us. Cars work for us. AI will work for us. Um, and there's many, many examples of amazing AI being deployed today. Like Google is an AI company, which makes your m ability to access information like 10,000 times faster. Um, so I, 
it's an ongoing discussion. It's very heated, and you might have a different opinion than my opinion, but I'm an optimist. Can you tell us more about the nanodegrees by Udacity and how are they different from MOOCs? Now, that's a good question. Our, our PR and <laughs> business development people would like me to talk about that. Um, so MOOCs, again, massive open online courses, go back to 2011, the very first version. Sebastian has 160,000 students. Coursera gets uh, founded. edX gets founded. Udacity, uh, we all start getting to the space and launching like 1,000 courses total. Uh, little been known to anybody, MOOCs had been around much longer. Um, MIT Open Courseware had uh, classes that were online. They were very much like MOOCs that just weren't as attracted to the media. And we are in this world where the prophecy is higher education will die tomorrow morning because of Sebastian. Um, the problem with MOOCs is it's just like a book. It's like content in most parts. It's like basically access to content. And um, just like books don't get read all the way to the end, MOOCs almost never get taken all the way to the end. Very few people complete a MOOC, like 2% of people complete a MOOC. Um, we recognize this very quickly and did a ton of experiments in Udacity to understand, like, why is that? Why, why do people not complete? And how can we get people to complete? Because if you have a product that people start using and then they put away after a day, that's not a good product. That's actually not a good business either. They have a bad product. Um, so we asked the question, how can we make people finish? And we arrived at basically two insights. Um, one insight, you have to have a credential that matters. So if you just, if you do a lot of weight loss and you exercise like crazy in the gym, but you lose no weight, that's not good. So you want to have something in the end that's good for you. So that's why we created the nano degree as a now recognized credential that gets you a job. Okay, that's a big deal. And secondly, we found that, and we can give you tons of data, that just access to content is not the same as education. So education to us is much more, you build something, you get feedback. Uh, it's learning by doing. Uh, when you learn by doing, it's not just access to content, someone telling you do it, and then you do it and nothing happens. It's really the context of having like, small teams, having feedback from your mentors, and telling you did really well, you can improve this over here. So we made education in nano degrees much more like a small school. You interact with lots of people. It's our global mentor network. So the experience today, you would not recognize if you took AI class uh, between nano degree today and AI class. It's a completely transformed experience. And the finishing rates in some courses are as high as, as, high as 90% as a result. Um, so that's a long story um, for, well, if you start a company, you have to keep innovating. And we had a singular metric, which is how many people finish our courses. And we got to the point where we now at a point where uh, the graduation rate from nano degrees is about 25% but the finishing rates in courses is up to 90%, 93%. Okay, um, Elon Musk compares building artificial intelligence to summoning the demon. What is your opinion? So I, I, I am a great admirer of Elon, but I think on this point he's kind of fallen down the deep end, um, my opinion. He's, he's actually, he's a pessimist. Like he, he, he wants to go to Mars because human civilization is under threat and the only way to, to escape is, is Mars. Um, that's kind of a pessimistic version for me. I mean, I want to go to Mars because I want to see some new space, but not because we are under threat. And he's also of the opinion that AI is threatening the humanity, and, and he wants to escape to Mars. How Mars would be AI-free when, <laughs> when the Earth is full of AI that kills people is unclear to me. Um, I think, um, I mean, it's anyone's bet. Elon has a good argument. He basically says, look, AI is getting smarter and smarter than people. Once they outsmart us, they're just going to enslave us. And they're going to live with us, but we're going to serve up to them. Um, I can't see this. I don't think it's in our interest. Um, and even though we build technology is much better than us, um, I can't see it enslaving us. But if he's right, then maybe all our children are doomed. I don't know. It's an open discussion. Ami Raza, GT2007, welcome to India. Hope to remember me. Yes, I do. Where are you? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Next one. Uh, what are changes and trends do you expect we'll see in the field of education? Um, now, this is, of course, a, a biased question because I'm putting all my time in, into inducing those changes. But to me, the higher ed system that we have today is, is completely inadequate. And I think we are in the beginning of a change that's as big as... as E-commerce is to commercial, conventional retail. It's going to really flip over. Um, 
And the reason is, I mean, the education system was built in a time when people had one job. And it's really built, I guess, in the 19th century, or 20th century, um, and hasn't changed since. And today's needs are very different. Today, people have many jobs. They need to stay current. Technology moves faster than ever before. We live longer than ever before. So I see us really kind of finding alternative universities that use online, that are cost effective, and so on, of which my company is hopefully one. Uh, I've spoken enough about this. So how do you, um, that was a Google Car question. How do you solve moral decision-making problems in Google Cars, solving the trolley problem? Now, that's an interesting one. This has filled the, the news papers like crazy, and I don't understand why. The Google self-driving car is faced with the possibility of killing a five-year-old on, girl on the left and a 93-year-old lady on the right side. Which one should I pick? <laughs> <laughs> it's a trolley problem. Uh, there's like 20 different versions of it, some involving trolleys and other things. Uh, my answer usually is the, the Google driver, self driving car is safe. It's not gonna, never get in a situation that, that it can hit either one, honestly. It's just going to slow down early enough to avoid the accident. Um, it's one of these bizarre problems. I mean, if you deal with technology, right? I mean, let's say you have a small child and you, 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 you buy a kitchen knife, right? And the kitchen knife is really great for, for cutting your, your cucumbers but could be used by your child to hurt itself, right? What's the moral situation? Should you buy a kitchen knife or not? And, guys, wake up. <laughs> um, the way I look at this, every technology uh, that's new has the potential of killing people. And, and, and every technology that's new does kill people. Um, and kills people, like even autopilots in plane have killed people, right? And uh, ABS systems, anti-lock braking systems have killed people that otherwise would be safe. And in the end of the day, we as a society, we take these trade-offs and we, we have one the technology that keeps, makes us safer on average. Medication kills people. If you go to the doctor, people die in hospitals. They would otherwise stay at home, would not die in hospitals. Um, so I think it's much more of a, I see it much more of a, we will get into the situation where we build the car as good as possible and there'll be failure modes and the failure modes will cause problems and accidents and Google will be held liable, whoever sells us will be held liable. Um, for these things, and that's, that's correct, that's good. So if there's damage and it's being caused by a, a malfunction or a, a fault of a product, then the manufacturer should be, should be liable. And then as we're able to have fewer accidents with self-driving cars and human-driven cars, your insurance rate will go down, not up, right? Because the totality of uh, damages that has to be paid will be smaller. And as we get to close to zero accidents, I think we will get a situation where not only do we save many lives, but also your costs will go down because you pay a lot of money on, on, on the consequences of accidents. So I, I see this um, um, much less as a moral issue, I see this as much as a practical issue. What are you afraid of uh, that I'm running over time? Um, 350. Oh God, what am I afraid of? <laughs> Very few things actually. Um, not much. I guess I love to learn, so I would, I would hate it to be in a situation where I can't learn anything new anymore. Um, what are the uh, challenges involved in inventing self-conscious machine? I don't know what self-conscious is. Um, I would hate for my dishwasher to be self-conscious. <laughs> like you walk up and see and push the button and say, wash my dishes and say, no. <laughs> Please wash my dishes. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a philosophical debate. Actually, and all these things, um, what we tend to do as people, we tend to kind of equate the machines with us. Like, how do you build machines like humans, right? How do you build machines that cheat and lie, right? Which humans do. Um, I see this as complementary. Like, I, I don't want the human traits. I want the machine traits, right? I don't want an airplane that flaps its wings just because birds flap wings. I want an airplane that flies really fast uh, and, 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 and flies at 30,000 feet where birds don't fly. Um, so I think I... I'm totally happy with non-self-conscious machines. I don't want them to be self-conscious. I just want them to work for me. Um, so the challenge is hopefully no one invents one of those. Um, there's a master's program by Udacity by Georgia Tech. Um, when can we get more such courses? So for those of you, some of you, is anybody enrolled in the master's program at Georgia Tech? Wow, sweet. How far? Hmm? Cool. Are you enjoying it? Cool. So before we did nanodegrees, we worked with Georgia Tech to create a master's degree, and it's phenomenally successful. 
We, we persuaded Georgia Tech to lower the tuition cost from $45,000 to $6,000, um, which is still a lot of money, but it's, it's a big deal in academia to make something cheaper. Um, and it's been ongoing. It's been, we have about 3,000 students. The student feedback is as good or better than on campus. Um, the student <coughs> level of quality is actually higher than on campus. Um, so it's been a, a great success. We decided to not do more of those. And the reason is working with universities is much harder than working with companies. So we'd rather build a program with you guys on something you care about than working with universities. It's just very complicated, unfortunately. So I have no clue how many meetings I sit through to sort of all these details because they're all very nervous about what happens to academia if we make a degree cheap. Uh, so great you're in it. Um, no, this one will run for a long time, but you're not going to make any new ones. We instead pushing nano degrees. Uh, do you see the MOOC as a way to empower people with the freedom to learn whatever they want and move away from the traditional education system? Absolutely yes. Our mission is to democratize education. We believe education should be a basic human right, and we believe if everybody has access to high-quality education, we can double the world's GDP. I really believe this. Um, so I think there's a, there's a mission here. Um, to really empower people. And if you look at geographically places like Africa, there's entire countries that have just no good education system, period. So the people born, they have just no chance to begin with. And I want to change that. Um, what are the first few things that came into your mind before inventing the Google car? And what were the first things you solved while working on the Google car? Uh, before the Google car, I worked in robotics a lot. I actually built robots that crawl into abandoned mines to map them. I built robots for elderly care. None of them made any sense, but it was a lot of fun to do academically. I got tenure on it at Stanford, uh, so it was useful. Um, the first thing I solved, so in building the Google self-driving car, um, one of the most important things I did is uh, having a clear metric of performance. And our metric was the number of miles we can drive without human intervention. And in the beginning, it was abysmally bad, so we drove not one mile, we drove like 0.001 mile, like 10 meters, and the car would go onto a curb or into a traffic light. And then we had a list of top 100 problems, which was daunting and long. And then a month later, we could drive a quarter of a mile, and half a year later, we could drive three miles. And basically, um, we were able to get about 10 as much range within about 12 months, roughly, at that speed. But what the metric did, it really helped my engineering team to prioritize. So we would drive every day. We had eight cars in operation in the beginning. Now it's over 40. Every day, collect accident reports. Or accident, incident reports, careful. <laughs> Typically, the human safety driver had to take over, so we never had an accident to be caused. And then we would stack rank these causes, and we had a list. And my engineers would send the room and say, I pick number one, I pick number two, I pick number three. So as a result, we never had any debates what to do next. We, we were like a machine. And that absence of debates uh, made it possible to really focus on progress. And if you work through your top 100 list, one after the other, eventually you get to number 100, and eventually your car drives. Uh, now it can probably drive about 500,000 miles without incidents, a huge number of miles, um, way surpassing human beings in the ability to avoid accidents. Google or Tesla? Uh-huh. Um, I drive a Tesla. I don't drive, I don't, I don't drive a Google. Um, what were your OKRs while working on the Google car? I hate OKRs. <laughs> They're really bad. <laughs> it's like, I mean, you guys know this from my company. We had this debate. We, we had this debate where we did an OKR. We're going to have 10,000 students by month 14. And then they come again, this big debate, it's unrealistic, it's too ambitious. Oh, you guys are not trying hard enough. <laughs> when you do something new, I don't think you can predict, you can only aim. So we decided we have an O, which is an objective to make the car drive as, as many miles as possible without human intervention. And we couldn't care about the uh, timeline it would take. I think OKRs are mostly a metric for micromanagement, honestly. I think they're really bad. And the fact that you're doing quarterly, <laughs> It's even worse. Um, I think we should do them every three years or so. Um, <laughs> I can see some emotions coming up. <laughs> 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 Honestly, I mean, it's a longer story about how to manage, but I think there's a, I mean, the OKRs tend to change every quarter, and it, it, it sucks. I mean, 
Um, what are the first two things that came in your mind before inventing? I've had this already. Book recommendations, please. I don't read books like someone else can answer this question. Uh, only write books. What do you think about the challenges for a huge and diverse? <laughs> oh, sorry. Are we out of time? <laughs> Three more minutes. What are the challenges for a huge and diverse country like India to develop technologically and build the world's best products? How to overcome these? Um, I'm actually really um, thrilled by being in India because, I mean, just seeing you in this room and not texting all the time, um, you guys have so much power and so much energy. This is really amazing. What I always find a little bit sad is, um, and then I'm speaking as a German, there's a, such an imbalance in terms of innovation. And you guys are the exception in this country. You're doing amazingly well. But um, given that you have 1.3 billion people, 90% um, of the apps in the App Store should come from you guys and not from America, from the United States. And there's something bizarre going on in terms of being fearless and, and aiming high and doing crazy stuff. Um, that I can't find in Germany. So Germany is trying really hard to build Silicon Valley in Berlin. I know that Bangalore has been taught of the Silicon Valley of, of India. But still, there's a, there's a difference between being totally fearless and somewhat fearless. And the fearless people somehow end up in, in Silicon Valley. Um, I often describe to my friends um, Silicon Valley as uh, we are both extremely arrogant and extremely humble. Um, Arrogant in that we, we are willing to pick something as dangerous. Like, I want to double the world's GDP with education. That's pretty arrogant. Um, and humble, we have no clue how to get there. So we have to be <laughs> totally open-minded along the way. And any other combination doesn't work. If you're only humble, then you, don't, then you, you, make, you open a pizza bakery. Um, if you're only arrogant, then you know everything. You're never going to learn from your mistakes. It's really bad. Um, so you have to be somewhere in between. Um, um, anyhow, so I think I'm out of time. It's maybe one last. Um, last one, 358. Uh, what would you recommend to be the life career path of someone who likes inventing and working on this stuff on the tech bleeding cutting edge? Um, so some career advice. Uh, first time, if you do really well in your job and people love you, you're productive, quit. It's really important. Um, because you're probably not challenging yourself uh, at the level you should be challenging yourself. Um, just like the self-driving car learns really fast, I think the basic career advice I have is put yourself in an uncomfortable situation, situations where you, where you suck, where you, where you don't perform well, because that's the only way to grow. Um, I, I mean, like, from my own perspective, I used to be a professor for a long time, and I'm surrounded by professors. Professors have tenure, right? So this is like the most retarded thing to have a lifetime position. It's the most safety-conscious thing. So for a long time, I was safety. I was super safe. Like, I was 30 years old. I had tenure. I could predict that has a salary 30 years in the future, right? It's like the words. And then at some point I decided it's just the wrong thing to do. I just quit. So I quit tenure at Stanford. My dean was very puzzled that any professor would ever give up tenure. But I said, it's, and, and I think in hindsight, it's the best thing I ever did. Um, because they really exposed me uh, and put me in situations I'm uncomfortable. Like I became a Google mid-level manager and I had to deal with a big company and that was uncomfortable. And I had to learn how to swim and then eventually the Google X. And then when I was doing really well at Google X, I decided, okay, it's time to do Udacity. Um, and I became a CEO. And boy, do I suck in terms of being a CEO. So I've, I made every single mistake in the book. And I've, I'm learning. We're doing well now. The company's doing phenomenally well, I should say. It shouldn't be too negative. We're growing really well. We have a fantastic team. I think our team is very, very happy. And it's extremely productive. Um, but it took me a time to, to understand what it means to be a CEO. There's no book, there's no course on how to be a CEO. Um, so I, I mean, I don't want to persuade you <laughs> to leave Flipkart, but um, I, I, if there was one lesson that I would love to bring to people, I mean, um, be fearless. Um, put yourself in a situation where you can grow and, and you can challenge yourself. Don't be afraid of making mistakes because those mistakes are the only chance to learn. Uh, the experience is just the accumulation of all the things you did wrong in your life. If you didn't do anything wrong in your life, you have no experience in what you do. Um, anyhow, thank you so much. Thank you, Sebastian, for coming here and telling us all this. And uh, I hope not many people, you know, hate OKRs even more now. <laughs> or, uh, you know, leave Flipkart and go do other things. But uh, 
we'll have uh, great learnings from here. Thank you. Once again, thank you, Sebastian, for uh, joining us here. And a big thanks to Piyush for making this happen. And uh, let's give Sebastian a big round Flipkart applause. Thank you. We will be sharing the link to this video soon, so you can watch it offline later too. Thank you.